Well, welcome to worship today. Glad you're with us at FOS. And I tell you what, live is way better than streaming. Last Sunday, Mike, it was really cool. It was on the mission trip in, uh, in Mexico, and um, the signal in our hotel room was, was kind of blowing up, blowing up, and we moved down to, the, to a cafe where the signal was a lot better. And it was beautiful, man. We got to see Tim preach. He did a great job. And, our, of course, our band and singers, we love all that. And it was great tech team. Thank you for making that possible and to take part in worship 3,000 miles away or however far it was. Uh, and it was really awesome to do that, but it's way awesomer to be here in person. So uh, we're glad to be back and glad to be part of worship today. Well, listen, there's an important principle in life, and it's this. No matter where you come from, you always have a choice about where you're going next, right? No matter where you come from, you always have a choice about where you're going next. No matter what your past is, no matter what the cards that were dealt you when you were born and what you grew up with, you always have a choice about what's next in your life, right? And so I want to share that concept with you today in a couple of different ways. First of all, I want to share with you a video. This comes from ESPN and, and uh, Sports Center. It's kind of a neat thing they do, these extended feature things sometimes. A story about a little basketball team. It'll make sense when you see it, and we'll come back. And just keep that in mind, no matter where you come from. It's never as important as where you're going. I was one of these kids, and so I know the struggle. I experienced the struggle. When they talk about not wanting to go home, the drama, the abuse, the fighting, the drugs, going without water and electricity in the home, sometimes two or three weeks at a time. How are you going to concentrate in school knowing there's not going to be any food there today? Mom's drunk. You know, she's so drunk, she's passed out. She's passed out on the porch, and you're living in a, a rat-infested house that's really condemned. Now, who wants to go home to that? That's what I was going home to. And some of them, when we take them home, that's what we see. This is nothing compared to what you're going to face in your life. 20, 25, 30 years from now, when I'm gone, and you come home, and you find out your husband has lost his job. That's adversity. That's something you'll have to come up with. This is nothing. This will prepare you for that. This is an opportunity in the most important game, not a basketball game. It doesn't matter who you are. The most important game we all play is in the game of life. One, two, three. Ladies And that's the one that matters. Get up. Hustle back. Don't reach. We can't get the ball across half court. It's going to be hard. I'm just telling you. We may not score. Look. Don't give them a layup. Watch inside. There's nobody left to dribble. The two that can are on the bench. Summer, shoot that ball. Aaliyah, no. doesn't matter what anybody in the stands thinks. I don't care. You're not losing. You're playing. The score doesn't matter. We got a pretty good shot that night. That was our 208th straight loss, according to the record, you know, the records book that we keep. The biggest underdog in all the sports is Carroll Academy Lady Jags. And people love the underdog. We love the underdog. And those nine girls, they're the biggest underdog. And this is my bedroom. Some of the staff has helped me with trying to cope with some of my problems at home or like my anger and stuff like that. My mom drank when she was pregnant with me. She, I mean, she's an alcoholic, so she's been in and out of my life constantly. And my dad just put a stop to it because he was tired of seeing me and my sister. Like she would say she was going to come get us for the weekend and we would sit by the window waiting and she would never show up. Losing streak. All right, let's go. One, two, three. Lady Jane! You know their success when you see a kid that's drug free. Their grades are up. In my eyes, I know we've had success. I don't have any doubt about it. Out here on the jump shot on the left side, banked in. Good. Is it a three? Yes. A jump shot off the left side, banked it in. This could be history. You never know when it's going to happen. And there's a whole story they're waiting to write. Driving into the lane, Carroll Academy got one. Drilled it. Long. 
long one for three. Bullseye! That one way down the hatch. You got to call bank on those, Hannah. Been a long time since the Lady Jags have had a bucket, trying desperately to keep it respectable. We all worked our best. We all tried. The outcome wasn't that good, but we pushed them to where they had to actually work. Driving in, going up. Good! We scored to what, 30? 29. Oh my gosh, we did good. That's probably the most proud I've ever had been able to play. You'll miss it. You'll see, you'll get up and think about Mr. Patrick getting you on the band route. Some of us won't, I mean, we won't play basketball again, so it helped me forget about all the current things going on, cleared my mind. It's helped me be a better person. I think Jordan wants to tell you something. Thank you for coaching us. She's pretty magnificent, isn't she? Number 12. And I think what Coach Hatch has been teaching them is it's not really about where you've been, it's where you're going, right? It's not always about the scoreboard that the world sees, it's about what's going on inside of you. Because your past is never as important as your future. And where you've been is never as important as where you're going. And God can do amazing things in ordinary ways. You know, I think that coach, Coach Randy Hatch, I think he's one of my new heroes. And I think the Lady Jags is like my new favorite team. What do you think? And I love that. And I love what's going on there. And, man, we could make a difference like that because where people are isn't as important as where they're going. And this theme, this idea runs throughout the Bible. It runs throughout scriptures. It runs through ancient stories from the Old Testament. And I want to share with you an ancient story today. And like all good stories, it starts like this. Once upon a time, in a great walled city, in a land far, far away, in a time long ago, there was a fair maiden. And she spent her days at her mother's side working in the hole in the wall tavern. And as she worked beside her mother in that tavern, she learned how to serve drinks and she learned how to serve meals. She learned how to serve men in times after hours. She learned a lifestyle. She learned a way of life that was comfortable to her, that made sense to her. And she earned her way in a world that would be strange to us. She grew up in a great walled city in a land called Canaan. And in that land, people served different gods than we're used to. They worshipped those gods in different ways. They lived in a place where agriculture was all important. And to ensure that they had good crops and that they had plenty of rain, they would serve those gods in unusual ways in temples that would be strange to us and foreign to us, where the priests had sex with temple prostitutes in order to garner favor from their gods. And this was the land of this fair maiden. And this was her life. In the tavern, the hole-in-the-wall tavern, day after day, serving merchants from near and far, and learning stories of faraway lands, and learning the dialects of different people, and learning different languages, learning to relate to a world that would come in and out of the city gates, which were just down and to the right from the back window of the hole-in-the-wall tavern. So she would see travelers coming and going, and armies coming and going from from the king sent out to the surrounding lands and farmers going out to tend their fields and coming back at night. And so as she witnessed the life of the city, she had her finger on the pulse of the city in a way not many people had. On the front of the tavern, she could see out into the city from a porch that was out in front. Kind of they had to take steps up to this porch and you could see out into the city and then you'd go through the tavern into the back and you could see out into the countryside. So she had a unique view of the city from the hole in the wall tavern. She spent her days there. She spent her evenings there. She had a room upstairs. She was so busy with the tavern as she grew older. Her mother passed away and then the tavern owner passed away and she inherited the whole enterprise. And she grew the business and she learned new ways of making different kinds of brew from different kinds of, of grain that was grown in the area. And she kept that grain drying on the roof of this tavern. And day after day, as travelers would come and merchants would come, she would visit with them and she would learn their stories and she would serve tables and occasionally she would earn extra money in other ways after hours. And it was all normal to her. This was her life. 
One evening, as she was serving tables there, she noticed a couple of young men who obviously were not from her city, who spoke a dialect she didn't recognize at first, but the more they spoke in whispered tones, the more she began to know, oh, these are part of the Hebrews. These are part of the Israelites. And these were feared people in Jericho because the people of Jericho had heard the stories of these Israelites as they roamed in the wilderness nearby. They had heard stories of the God of the Israelites who had rescued them in miraculous ways, who had, who had allowed them to cross a sea on dry land and then who had drowned Pharaoh's entire army and who led those people with fire and clouds and who fed them each day with this strange thing called manna from heaven. The people inside of her city had heard the stories of these Hebrews. And as she served their table that night, she would linger a little bit longer each time and learn a little bit more of what they were talking about. And they were talking about the, the might of the city. They were talking about the thickness of the walls, the number of fighting men, the apparent power of the king, where the weaknesses in the walls might be. And it became apparent that these were spies. Her heart beat a little bit faster because she knew something was on the way. Not only did she notice them, but some of the king's advisors who were having a dinner there that night noticed them as well. And the king's advisors left abruptly without even getting the check, and they ran back to the king to tell him what was going on. It was near closing time anyway, so she went ahead and locked up for the evening and then took the two spies upstairs to the roof where the flax was drying and all the other grains were drying. And she explained to them what was getting ready to happen, that the king had been, had been notified and would be coming soon. And she hid them there on the rooftop. And she went back downstairs and began to tend tables. And sure enough, the knock at the door came and the king's armed forces showed up looking for the spies. And she told them, yeah, well, they were here. I'm not really sure why they were here, but they were here. But man, they just went out the gate. I saw them go out the gate and they took off down the road. And they were, they were, pretty, they were going pretty fast. But if you take off right now, you can still catch them. And she used her best powers of persuasion and sent them on their way. And the king's men chased them out the city gates. The gates closed behind them. And she waited just a while. She gathered her thoughts. And she went back to the rooftop. And she spoke with these two spies from the Hebrews and she explained the story she had heard about their God and the story she had heard about the might of these people under the hands of this God, a far different God than the gods that she knew, a far different God than the gods that she had grown up serving, a far different God than the people of Jericho knew, but one that she was intrigued by. And in her heart, she knew that at that moment, at that time, that it didn't matter very much where she was from. It mattered a whole lot more about where she was going to go. And as she shared with those spies her knowledge of them, she asked for a favor. She said, as I've shown kindness to you and hidden you here and saved your lives, would you spare the lives of my father and my sisters and my brothers and their children? Because that was her great joy. She never had children of her own. Her great joy was her father and her brothers and sisters and her nieces and her nephews who would gather at the tavern for great family meals. They would enjoy time together. That's who she loved. And she begged for mercy for them. And the spies made a pact with her that evening on a rooftop under a full moon. And here was the pact. We will save you and your family. Whoever is gathered in this hole-in-the-wall tavern when we return. Now here's the rope you're, that we need to escape by. She was going to lower them with this red rope through a window, just one floor below, down the outside wall. But they left the rope with her, the scarlet rope, and they said, here's the deal. After we leave, you hang this in the window. When we return, that we promise that not a hair on the head of anyone gathered with you will be harmed. 
we swear by our own hearts and by our own blood, by our own heads, that you'll be safe. However, if you give away our plans, or if anyone is not gathered in that house, then their blood is not on us. And she lowered them out that window, down the wall, on that scarlet rope. And they ran off to the wilderness, and they waited a few days. In the meantime, she took that rope and gathered it back up and hung it in that window and waited. It would be weeks before they would return. The spies took their time and allowed the, king, the king's men to return to Jericho before they hit the road, and, and they went as quickly as they could back to Joshua and the armies that were waiting there, the people of Israel. And they told them the stories of Jericho, of its strengths and its weaknesses, of the king, and of this prostitute known as Azonis who had saved their lives. And as Joshua and the people of God began to march toward Jericho, God intercepted them with a new plan. Not a likely military plan, but a very effective plan. And so when the armies arrived, they camped near Jericho. The people of Jericho knew they were on the doorstep and they closed up the city tight. And they began to shake with fear because they knew that this God was more powerful than their gods. That these people served a God who was far stronger than their gods. And they waited. Then Joshua, early one morning, takes his entire team of people and they begin to march around the city and quietly, without making a sound, they just march around the city one time, day one, and they go back to camp. Day two, they get up. They walk quietly and they work, walk around the city. Then day three, they get up early and they walk around the city. And it's like a giant python squeezing its prey and beginning to wrap its coils around the city. And it got harder and harder to breathe because the fear was overwhelming. Day four, they marched again. Then day five. Then day six. Day seven. They marched once. Then they marched twice, then three times, and then four times, and the coils are drawing tighter, and five times. The fear in the city is overwhelming, six times, seven times. And on that time, the people shouted, and the trumpets blew, and the walls fell, and the city was routed as the Israelites rushed in, and they overtook all of the people of Jericho except for one family. There was one family gathered behind that window where that scarlet rope hung and they were all saved. The book of Joshua in the Old Testament tells us this, that that Zonas, that prostitute and her father and all of her family were saved and they began to travel with the people of Israel. They had a new family because your past is never as important as your future. Where you've been is never as important as where you're going. The gods and the way of life you used to have aren't nearly as important as the God of your future and the God who wants to walk with you and the God who invites you into a new family. And she walked with the Israelites and made her home with them. And we know that she walked with them because the book of Joshua tells us, but then the New Testament writer of Matthew picks up the storyline, and he tells us this. As he recounts in Matthew chapter 1, the story of the line of Jesus Christ, of the lineage of Jesus Christ. He recounts person by person by person in the lineage of Jesus Christ. And in that lineage, there's that fair maiden from a far-off city that's written into the story of God. Rahab marries a Hebrew man, and she has a son. 
And they're all three written into the line of the Son of God. Because your past is never as important as your future. Where you've been is never as important as where you're headed. And in an amazing way, God took that story of two spies visiting a prostitute in a great walled city and grafted her into the story of God. And that's how God does things. That's how God works because your past is never as important as your future. Where you've been is never as important as where you're going. And that scarlet rope hanging in the window becomes a symbol for how God saves people. You see, Jesus came to the earth and he said, the Father sent me so the whole world would be saved. And Jesus would hang on a cross. And his blood would flow, that scarlet blood would flow. And we'd create a window for us to be saved through. He would create a safe place for all who would follow him, for all who would shift allegiance from your old gods and your old ways to a new God and new people. And that's the story of Grace of God writing unlikely people like Rahab into the line and the story of God. You see, your past is never as important as your future. So no matter where you come from, you always have a choice about where you're going next. And today, you have a choice. No matter where you come from, no matter what your past is, no matter... How lost you think you are, how bad you think your past is, no matter how many mistakes you think you've made, no matter how you grew up or how horrible your situation was that you grew up in and choices you made and some of those choices because they just fit your culture like Rahab. Rahab, she wasn't living in opposition to God. She was just going along with the culture she was a part of. But when she learned there was another way, when she knew there was another God, she shifted allegiance. And today, I'm asking you to shift allegiance. I'm asking you to change. I'm asking you to allow this Jesus Christ to be your scarlet cord of redemption. I'm asking you to let him be the one that would save you, that would make you right with God, that would rescue you for a new future. And maybe even through you being rescued, your family would be rescued too. Because you would change your allegiance and it would change your whole future. Because it doesn't matter so much where you come from as where you're going.